Well, it's a very distinguished crowd. I'd like to welcome you all here this morning. Uh, thanks for coming. Now, why don't you all come forward a bit if you're in the back rows here? Are you comfortable where you are? Comfortable? Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, I'm going to talk for a few minutes this morning about building a business of the future. It's loosely based around my book, which I'll tell you around, tell you about in a, in a minute. Um, just so, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I head up the Entrepreneurial Services Group at Smith & Williamson. Uh, I've done various things in my life, started off being an accountant, ran my own business, sold it, uh, invested in a number of other businesses, and, and uh, some successfully, I'm delighted to say. Uh, as usual, there are always some that aren't successful. Um, I became a sales and marketing director for five years, which was a very interesting experience. And uh, now, of course, I'm trying to help growth businesses achieve their dreams. And we do that at Smith & Williamson by working with owners and providing a whole array of commercial, financial, and taxation advice um, to those owners. Uh, above all, as it says at the bottom, I'm quite an enthusiast. Uh, I can't help getting involved in stuff and getting excited about it. One example of that, actually, is that um, you may have heard of the Cater and Formula One team that got into trouble um, uh, a month or two ago. Well, Smith, Smith and Williamson are the administrators of the Cater and Formula One team, and we have, we have launched a crowdfunding campaign to get them to Abu Dhabi for the last race of the season. Um, they have gone. I'm delighted to say we've been successful. And so far we've raised 1.9 million from 6,000 backers, or fans, if you like, uh, to get them there. So that's the sort of way we like to try and help our clients by coming up with creative ideas. So um, in terms of the book, there it is, available for £10, £9.50 if you're kind, eight quid if I have to sign it for you. Um, but uh, the book came out in 2011. It's really a guide uh, from vision to exit, as it says. So how do you start a business, uh, grow it, and either keep it or sell it, and I'm not gonna cover anything about exit today, but my first question to anyone who's built a great business is why would you want to sell the best business you'll ever own? And indeed, that's very topical at the moment because um, there are all sorts of talks about scale-ups, not startups. Uh, this week, Global Entrepreneurship Week, uh, Sherry Kutu, CBE, has launched a report called the Scale-Up Report, Scale-Up Britain, and it is all about how we actually build businesses of scale, rather than finding entrepreneurs build businesses worth 5, 10, 15, 20 million and think, well, I've done my job now, I can go and live in the Cotswolds. And that does happen all too frequently in the UK. We're looking for people who are going to carry on past that. And to do that, of course, we need lots of skills, and that's what the Scale Up Report is about. And Steve Gilroy can help you with that, can't you, Steve? Put your hand up in the audience there. Steve uh, runs Vistage, the Chief Executives Network, um, and they run all sorts of groups that can help people grow these businesses. So briefly, the story behind the book was that I was sailing a very small boat down in Devon and uh, doing very badly. My cousin is a, a, a very well-known yacht designer, uh, and I rang him up one day and I said, Nigel, how do you win a yacht race? And he said, well, he said, it's a very simple guy. All you've got to do is 100 things better than anybody else. And um, so I thought, well, that's a pretty good thing to think about in terms of business. And that's actually where the origins of the book came from. How do you do 100 things better than anyone else? It actually started with a road test, 100 things you've got to do better than anyone else, and then turned into this book. And I would like to say there are far more than 100 good things in this book, which you need to have a look at. But, uh, so that's that. So just briefly today, a um, little bit about my beliefs. Um, I am more of an entrepreneur than an accountant at heart, uh, and I hope that my beliefs reflect that. Um, uh, something about entrepreneurial traits, and then a few looks at a few of the, the, the bits of the content in the book, uh, which you can see here, which I will just touch on briefly. And if anyone wants to ask a question, it's not easy in this environment, but we'll see if we can get everyone uh, together at the end somehow. So here are some beliefs. Um, if you turn the same handle, 
you get the same result. We all know that's the definition of madness. It's amazing how many people are still convinced that if they carry on doing what they've always been doing forevermore, they think something will turn out differently, and it doesn't. Um, and it's not a surprise. You know, you have to experiment, you have to innovate, otherwise you will not be successful. Unless, of course, you have hit upon that magic formula. Uh, and even that will only last uh, for, a, for, a, for a period of time. So you've got to keep on innovating. Uh, my next one is, if you've got nothing to do, go and polish the church pews. Something will happen. A lot of people get what I call frozen in the headlights. Uh, they, they get to a situation in their lives or businesses where they think, you know, I just don't know what to do next. Uh, and the answer is, you've got to do something. You can't just sit there because, again, if you sit there and do nothing, nothing will happen. So, um, getting out there and going and polishing the church pews, uh, something will happen as a result. Bet on the future, well this talk is about building a business for the future. Obviously we're not interested in building a legacy business that is already out of date uh, and whose market is dwindling. So we have to think about what's happening in the world around us and at the moment we're being driven by things like globalization, tele technological innovation, uh, we've got lots of challenges around uh, talent, how do we get the right talent in our businesses, how do we raise finance for our business. So we need to think about innovative ways of actually overcoming the problems and taking advantage of the opportunities and that means betting on the future. Who cares wins? Uh, well that's very much uh, goes back to my uh, uh, background as a professional services provider. Uh, if you don't care people know and uh, in my view, it's an absolute mantra for what I do. Uh, we have to care uh, and do care uh, a, a huge amount about our clients, and that's why you need that sort of passion and enthusiasm to get involved in what clients are doing. And I think it's true across business. If you don't care about your customers, they're going to find out, and they're going to go somewhere else. And perhaps the most controversial of my uh, mantras is the last one, which is, if it isn't broken, break it. And uh, you probably know that that's not the normal way of looking at things. If it don't, ain't broke, don't break it, I think is the way that a lot of people look at the world. My view is that's a positive statement. There's always a better way of doing things than the current method. So it's an opportunity to do things differently or better. Um, uh, so don't ever sort of uh, get into that situation where inertia takes over and the status quo prevails. Innovation is key. So those are the mantras. Um, for you guys, who runs a business? Who's in the audience who's running a business? Okay, we've got a few here. Um, this, this really, oh, is that, can you see that? Yeah. Um, here, here's the A to Z of entrepreneurs. I mean, this should be look like, like looking in a mirror, really. Uh, you should be able to identify a lot of traits uh, that apply to you as an entrepreneur. And if, if they don't, if, if a lot of these, you know, if, if on balance you're saying, oh God, I'm not like that, oh no, that doesn't apply to me, you're probably in the wrong business, you probably need to get a job, to be honest. Um, so you do need to want to break things, um, and you do need to want to be very ambitious and very passionate. Um, these are, they're, and they're great words, uh, you know, and, and I used to know what um, xenodokio and xenomorphic meant when I wrote them. Uh, but I've completely forgotten. So if anyone wants to ask me a question about that, I haven't got a clue what the answer is. So uh, there you are. That's honesty for you. Um, so building a business in the future. Now this, this for you guys who are running a business, this may be obvious, but please bear with me because I just want to remind you about things you may have forgotten, really. And that's really something that you need to think about. So um, what's your vision? now? Vision is something you need to start a business. Um, and a lot of businesses start with some kind of vision which they forget about. I talk about companies that become the living dead. Uh, they actually don't know why they exist anymore. Uh, they're not quite sure why they started, but somehow or another they managed to scrape enough income to pay all the overheads of the people, collect the PAY and national insurance and VAT for the government and pay it over, and, and earn a, a, a small living along with that. So I don't think that's the way forward. I call that pushing water uphill. Uh, so you need to have some kind of vision 
uh, that you really believe in. Big visions uh, that we all wish we'd had. Well, Bill Gates, a, a, a computer on every desk. Henry Ford, a car for the masses. Jeff Bezos of Amazon, a store without walls. Stelios, uh, his easy jet, low cost flights, whatever it for the masses, etc. I mean, these are big visions which turned into great businesses. Now, unfortunately, we can't all have them. My vision is that I want to be the go-to firm, professional services firm for entrepreneurs in the UK. Well, that's a more achievable vision, provided I can saturate the UK with enough offices to, to have that local presence. But that's, the, uh, that's my vision. And um, in addition to vision, of course, how do you deliver the vision? You deliver the vision through having a strategy. And the strategy for me is that big picture that you paint around uh, your vision that enables you to communicate to the market what it is you're doing. It's not what you necessarily do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it is what you stand for. It's who you know in that market, how you get to the center of it, and, and who you need to influence in order to uh, be successful. So strategic issues are different from tactical issues. Tactical issues are attending conferences, giving speeches, holding other events, writing content, uh, doing some Twitter in the, you know, when, you, when you have a moment to get to your business audience or whatever it may be. That's the tactical stuff and that all falls into your business plan. So strategically, first of all, what is your vision and, 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 how, and, and strategically how are you going to achieve it? Is that possible? Uh, if it is, then you've got to start writing this business plan. And a business plan for me, a lot of people say, oh, you know, business plan should be 20 pages long, not 50 pages long. I don't care how long your business plan is. It could be one page long, um, as long as it clearly sets out the direction of travel, what you're going to do on a day-to-day -day basis, and, of course, looks after some very important areas such as how you're going to finance the business and how it's going to be managed. So these are really crucial issues to include in the business plan. Um, commerciality, of course, is a very important issue. Um, if you've got a business model that where you know, all the products or services you provide uh, need to be effectively given away, i.e. you're unable to make a decent profit on them, uh, then you're probably in the wrong business. So you have to look at things like business model of margin uh, to figure out whether or not there's actually a real business uh, that you can pursue. And again, depending on your uh, ambition, you need to think about scalability and whether or not you can create a big market. Now, of course, you can now create quite a big market out of quite a small niche due to technology the advances in, in the, the, the availability of uh, the web or the, and, and all that side of life. And one thing that isn't on here, yes it is on here, jolly good, is uh, you've got to be passionate about it, right? If you can't be passionate about your business, again, a bit like um, I said earlier, you should be thinking about uh, doing something else. There's absolutely no point in spending your life being miserable trying to pursue a business that actually isn't going to go anywhere or that you don't care about. So that's that. Um, just that was real basics. Now at the moment I started by t telling you about our crowdfunding campaign at F1. Uh, there are now a plethora of ways of financing a business. Is anyone in the room uh, who started their business and financed it themselves? Hands up. Okay. Who's raised third party capital? Okay, who's raised debt? Anyone got debt? Okay, you've got a bit of debt in there. All right. So um, businesses really get financed through three sources. One is uh, internal reserves or the reserves of the founder. Uh, another is external equity. And the third is debt. And you can't really get debt till you've got something to secure it against. Ah, good morning, Martin. How are you? Um, uh, so, uh, very important, however, I mean, we know that there have been problems with the banks uh, and we know now that there are also all sorts of other fintech businesses out there that can help you raise funding for your business. Now, you may, have, you may know who they are. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of Funding Circle, which is one of them uh, in the alternative uh, financial space. Another is Market Invoice, where it's like an eBay for individual invoices, where you can sell invoices on a one-off basis. 
So there are lots of different ways of getting access to debt in the current market. And some people say, you know, there's a shortage of money for companies. And I don't think that's necessarily true. I think there's, a, there's plenty of money around for good businesses. Uh, the question is, does your business qualify as a good business? Is that what an external third party is going to think about your business? However, there is now a plethora of interest in equity. Equity, of course, is when you give a stake in your business to a third party. And we typically start doing that by offering shares to families and friends. We move on to uh, uh, more formal business angels. And there are lots and lots of tax reliefs available these days uh, that can help you raise that money. So uh, who's heard of the SEIS and the EIS scheme? Everybody, anyone used it? Yeah, useful? Very useful. Yeah, so these schemes uh, operate to give investors either a 50% or a 30% discount on shares that they, have, they, that they uh, acquire in early stage or growing businesses. Uh, after three year holding period, they can be tax free. Um, the exit can be tax free, assuming you make a gain, of course, which is not as often as it, as it might appear. Um, and if you actually lose your money, you can get further tax relief. So these are really important, new, important um, uh, things to know about raising money. It makes, makes it much easier for an investor uh, to invest and it makes it much easier for a company to raise. However, uh, we, we move on up the funding scale. We can go through venture capital uh, providers for companies that will go through for fast growth, high risk, high growth businesses. We get to private equity, where, uh, which, is, which is institutional investment in your business, where you have a solid business and you're looking for development capital. Um, the problem with these kinds of investment are that I always say ownership determines outcomes. Once you've taken someone into your business and they're an owner in your business, you either have a moral or an actual responsibility to get them out again. Um, and agreements with institutions, etc., are built around uh, their requirement for a return and an exit. So you just need to be very careful that you know what you're getting into uh, before you start. Um, one of my colleagues says you need to, you know, if, you, if you're going to invest in a company, you need to back a digger, but it's always better if they're, back, they're digging on top of the gold mine. And I think that's very, very true. You know, so the, the, the investors are looking, if you're looking for investment in your business, they're looking at the management team, i.e. the diggers, and they're looking for the business and, and its area of expertise or specialism, i.e. the gold mine. Uh, so those are really important factors to, to, to get external uh, investment. And of course, it can be quite tempting when you get offered that million of funding for 20% of your business to say, Eureka, um, we've made it, I can now go off and run the business. Unfortunately, you need to, that's when you need to get serious and find out what the terms and conditions are of that million, because you could find uh, that um, the terms and conditions operate so that at the end of the day, you're not as wealthy as you thought you were going to be when you started the business. But the uh, the uh, best example of that I have is a company that was started by two individuals. It was sold for $100 million, and they got, between them, $600 of the sale proceeds. So that was an institutionally funded company, uh, which went wrong, and they ended up just getting a very, very small amount of that. So, so um, in terms of running a business, uh, you probably know the, the theory of artisans, heroes, meddlers, and strategists. Uh, my argument to you here today is that if you're going to run a big business, you need to learn to be a strategist. Uh, the artisan is the man who does, the hero is the man who does too much, um, and the meddler is the man who takes on some people because he's been doing too much but won't let them do their job. And it is a real struggle to get through that uh, and get the right people on board uh, to get to the end result. Because what you really need to be doing is a sort of helicopter approach looking down on your business and having the business run around you by very capable management teams. Uh, and if you can't get to that, we probably end up with something called owner dependency, 
which can very much restrict the value of your business should you ever wish to sell it. Um, delegation, not abdication, so uh, you can't just step away when you get sick of it or you lose your passion. Uh, I had a, a very interesting retail business. Uh, in 2003, they came to me and uh, asked me what I thought they were worth and we valued the company relatively informally and thought they were worth about 25 million, which was pretty good for the three shareholders involved. Uh, and they thought, you know, if only, they'd only been running the business for 25 years, and they said, well, if only we knew someone who was a real good retailer, if they could double the value of this business very, very quickly. Uh, and we could make 50 million, not 25. And so they went out and they took on a FTSE 100 director in that business. And they, that FTSE 100 director managed to turn the profit of 3 million in that business into a loss of 6 million in, a year, in one, one year. And basically bankrupted the business. So um, don't throw the keys at someone you think can do the job. You know, bring them in nice and gently and figure out whether or not they're doing the right things. Someone who did that actually was Nick Jenkins at Moonpig. He took a guy on as his COO, uh, secretly hoping that he would make the grade of CEO, which he did. And then Nick stepped upstairs to becoming equity chairman, uh, executive chairman, sorry.